it is a pleasure to be with all of you today. We're going to have a great conversation. And we're going to try and leave um, time at the end so that you can ask questions as well. So think about your questions now. Um, I'll tell you, uh, Secretary Chow basically needs no introduction, but I'm going to give her one anyway. Um, I think we all know she's the current U.S. Secretary of Transportation. This is her second cabinet position after serving as U.S. Secretary of Labor from 2001 to 2009. And she's also the first Asian American woman to be appointed to a presidential cabinet in American history. Um, Secretary Chow began her public service career working on transportation and as well as trade issues at the White House. She's also served as Deputy Maritime Administrator, U.S. Department of Transportation, Chairman of the Federal Maritime Commission, and Deputy Secretary of the Department of Transportation. Secretary Chow is also an immigrant who arrived in America at the age of eight speaking no English. And she received her citizenship at the age of 19. Her experience transitioning, we were talking a little bit about this earlier, um, her experience transitioning to a new country really informed who she is and how she approaches her work. And we're going to be talking about that a little in a, in a moment. Um, before coming to the Department of Labor, Secretary Chow was president and chief executive officer of United Way, and she also established the first programs in the Baltic nations and the newly independent states of the former Soviet Union. Secretary Chow earned her MBA from Harvard Business School. She has an economics degree from Mount Holyoke. She is the recipient of, get this, 36 honorary degrees. And she, <laughs> yeah, that is worthy of applause. Um, and she is also a resident of Jefferson County, Kentucky, with her husband, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Um, I'd love to start our conversation sure. with um, this concept that, you know, you are, on the one hand, the ultimate Washington insider, but you're also, you know, in an interview with USA Today's uh, Washington Bureau Chief Susan Page a few weeks ago, you talked about sometimes feeling like an outsider. And I'd love for you to expand on that and, and also explain to us how does that impact your role and how you approach your position. Well, first of all, I have to say, when uh, Joanne was going through my resume, this thought was going through my head. These people are going to think I can't hold a job. <laughs> I've had an incredible experience um, working in the nonprofit, the for-profit, and the public sector, and I feel you know, so incredibly um, blessed. Uh, I am an immigrant, and when we first came to America, I was eight years old. We moved into a one-bedroom apartment in Queens, New York. My father had come to America first, took him three years to bring my mother, my two sisters, and me to America. And the beginning was very, very tough. My father held three jobs, and we didn't, really sp we didn't speak English. So I think those feelings of uh, anxiety, of fear, of um, not fitting in uh, was a very seminal part of my life. And I think that they stay with me, as they would with many people. So I think it's so funny that people think I'm the establishment, because I don't think I'm the establishment. I'm still you know, fighting for the little guy, the underdog, who's trying to get a foothold in mainstream America. And I don't want to lose that feeling, because I think that understanding of that feeling of vulnerability, of fear sometimes, of anxiety, actually makes me a more empathetic leader. And I'm always trying to put myself in other people's shoes to understand where they're coming from, what they think, and how we can bridge the gap, whatever the issue is. And I'm so glad you mentioned that, the bridging the gap concept, because I've, now, I've been here for now uh, for three days and been to a number of sessions and participated in a few. And one of the recurring themes in so many of the sessions that we've all been in has been this enormous divide in our country right now, and particularly, you know, red state versus blue state, the extremes in our political spectrum right now. Um, that we have not had, uh, we haven't had anyone from the at the cabinet level, uh, in, from the Trump cabinet uh, here yet. And um, I think it would be really helpful for all of us to help um, to to get your perspective on 
Is there a way that we can bridge that divide? We do seem to be more divisive than ever before. How many of you were here for David Bradley's session about overcoming, <laughs> you know, hardships? And he, says, he said something really, really interesting. He says, life is full of ups and downs. And when you're on top, you just know at some point you're going to go through that down cycle. And if you're in that down cycle, take heart because you're going to go up again. There's no place else to go. And so he said when you're in the up cycle, it's really important to be humble. And so I want to give a shout out to Walter Isaacson and also his wife, Kathy, and Jane Harmon, who are dear friends. Because Walter and um, Kathy, they've been so nice to me. You know, when I'm in the government, when I'm out the government, they still talk to me. And we're great <laughs> friends. And so I'm here because of Walter. I, I've been here because, you know, when I was not in the cabinet, and then when I was invited to come back, of course. I mean, when Walter asks you to do something, the answer is always yes. And then Jane Harmon is here as well. You know, she's head of president of the Wilson Center. And she's doing a great job bridging the divide. And uh, so I'm very, very fortunate to know wonderful people like this. And I know that you do, you have people like that in your own lives as well. But when I talk about bridging the gap, you know, I don't agree with Walter um, a lot of times. I don't agree with Jane a lot of times. But we have tremendous respect for one another, great deep affection for one another, and we listen to one another. So I think in many ways, the environment that we're in today ghettoizes us into whether you're a blue or a, in a blue place or whether you're in a red, a red place. And we don't seem to be able to talk to one another anymore. And I think that, in fact, is, I believe, exacerbated somewhat by the media, who is just so hungry for 24-7. And I've been on television as a, you know, as a talking head, and it's always I get always more encouragement when I'm a little bit spicier, you know, when I'm kind of like more combative and I'm more bombastic. And a lot of times, the answers are not easy. They're hard. And I like more than six seconds to explain what the answers could possibly be. So I think, number one, we just have to be more patient with one another and that we continue to outreach and to talk with one another. But I don't want those who feel kind of um, discouraged, to feel discouraged. Because, you know, obviously, I come from a very different background. This is a very vibrant democracy in which you have a lot of very different opinions. And it's the tradition of our country to participate fully and, and, and uh, you know, full-throated, uh, uh, very robustly in the national dialogue, and I think that's good. So I think all of us, you know, if we just strive to try to explain how we, how we feel, why we feel the way we do, and then have a little patience in listening to the other side. So you've, you've brought up two incredibly important points, right, which is listening to one another and speaking respectfully. And that, that leads me to ask you about your relationship with President Trump. Um, who has said some things. I mean, um, today, for example, um, he made those comments about Mika Brzezinski, which we've probably all read about, that she has you know, low IQ and that she was, he saw her bleeding badly from a facelift. Um, how, how do you respond to something like that when the president is making comments like that? Well, the president is a citizen as well, and he says what he wants to say. I think one of the things that uh, is important is that you have to take a look at his actions. And I think to a certain group uh, within America, not group, but to a certain segment, um, the country was too dependent on government. It was uh, going in a direction that many disagreed with. And so he was able to touch a chord with a great number of people who felt that somehow this country uh, needed to have their voices heard. Now, he's not in politics, and so he's not used to the usual restraints that people in public service have. And so, you know, he's new. Uh, he well, will adapt and he'll learn. So, and I assume you do not agree with a comment like that, though you can tell us if you do agree. No, I don't agree. 
So what is your relationship with him? Do you have that kind of relationship where you can say to him, so Lindsey Graham, for example, tweeted today, Mr. President, that was not a presidential thing for you to do and to say. Do you have the relationship where you will, will call him out on these kinds of issues? What's most important is where the government is going. And I think for those of us who have agreed to serve um, in this government, we have a certain point of view as to where America should go. Um, big issues like infrastructure, uh, like uh, the regulatory regime, the vibrancy of our economy. How do we restore competitiveness? How do we restore and give opportunity uh, to Americans, uh, residents within our country? And those are the really important issues. But you know, you're... how do we bring economic vitality how do, back? How do we restore uh, jobs and opportunities for but, Americans? But you do agree, I, I disagree at times on some um, substantive I policy. I disagree with my husband issues, and we, we'll talk about that too. Um, uh, with President Trump, um, you, for example, have said that the uh, air traffic controllers are doing a good job. He has said that the FAA does a horrible job. I think that was misinterpreted. Uh, on, it was uh, on uh, June 13th, we had the launch of the um, President's proposal to delay, uh, to uh, address the delays and, con and congestions that we have in the national airspace. And so he talked about how long it takes for the air traffic control system to get up-to-date modern uh, equipment. And he was criticizing not the FAA and not the air traffic controllers, but rather the previous administration on their slowness in addressing this issue. Uh, so if you look at the transcript, he was actually addressing uh, the previous administration. You know, you also did mention sometimes you disagree with your husband, and while we're on that topic, I am curious about um, the uh, USA Today on the front page today, the headline was only 12% of Americans support the Republican health care plan. Um, obviously, the president is one of them, and your husband has been one of them. Are, are you as well? He is, um, I would say, in fact, he was, he's the leader in the Senate in terms of uh, bringing about a change in the uh, Affordable Health Care Act, which has resulted in private insurers withdrawing from many states in our country, leaving residents and citizens with no coverage at all. But so that so is a problem. So are you supportive of the plan as it is now? Well, I think I am more supportive of that kind of a plan than the Affordable Health Care Plan, because I am under the Affordable Health Care Plan. My husband and I both are covered by the Affordable Health Care Plan. And in the last two years, I have seen my prescription prices more than quadruple. I have seen my insurance rates um, go from $200 or so to $1,500. So I have seen firsthand the increases in premiums, in prescription prices, and in insurance rates that uh, was warned about before passage of the Affordable Health Care Act. So, so I think something has to be done about that. And once again, it's so non-compensatory that again, Aetna and many other private insurers are withdrawing from many of the states. And so if you're covered by this law to have insurance, but there are no insurers available in your state, then what good is that law? Because there are now no, insurance, no insurers available. So, so that's, that's a real problem, I and mean, that is coming down. And so that is what this uh, Republican plan is currently trying to address. It's gonna be a train wreck tomorrow, uh, in a year or so. And so what uh, Leader McConnell, my husband, was trying to say to his own troops is we address these issue now, issues now and try to get some benefits in the current bill, like uh, a reprieve on the uh, taxation on medical instruments and uh, a, a, a fix on the uh, exchanges. Because if the Republicans do not resolve it now themselves, number one, they're in charge. So they have a responsibility to do so. And number two, if they do not um, pass uh, the 
uh, uh, pass the current bill that addresses some of the, weak the weaknesses of the Affordable Health Care Act, then basically this problem will become so bad in a year that they're going to have the Republicans will have to deal with Democrats, and the Democrats will not give the Republicans anything that is in the current bill that the Republicans like. But so that was what Leader McConnell was trying to convey. Right, but there are also quite a few Republicans who now have come out against the plan as well. So there are about five to seven. Yeah, and 20, 12 percent of Americans don't. Or it's only 20, 12 percent of Americans, and only twenty six percent of Republicans support it, but you're, you're saying that you are supportive of this plan as it is. Well, you know, that's a big challenge for policymakers. The, the challenge is, you know, to try to get across your point of view, and I'm not a politician, I want to make that very clear, I'm a public servant, never ran for elective office. One statesman in the family is enough. <laughs> so uh, we have increasingly complex problems. And yet we in the public sector are increasingly under greater pressure to present the solution in six second sound bites. And this is very difficult. Uh, so it's hard to explain the complexity of the Affordable Health Care Act, the problems that it is running into, the increased insurance rates, increase in premiums, increase in prescription drug prices. All of this is coming to a head. Something has to be done. And the prudent thing is to address it now, but as we have often seen, the Congress doesn't act until it comes to a crisis situation because then the populace is aroused and something happens and then there's momentum for change. So that's the great balance. You know, how do you be preemptive and how do you try to address the future when perhaps the population is not totally with um, you know, the leaders on what the real problems are? Let me pivot for a minute. Sure. Um, you are one of the few women in the cabinet. You have, you have spent your career um, really breaking into primarily all male um, enclaves. And I'm curious about if you have advice for the women out here and for the men out here in how to navigate that. And, and you know, one of the issues, even Obama, who had a cabinet that was 44% female, um, some of you probably heard the story that the women, even the women there, felt that they were not heard in meetings. And you ladies out there will probably be familiar with that kind of thing where you're in a meeting and you say something and nobody seems to hear it, and then a guy says it like two minutes later, and everybody says, oh my god, Bob, you're a genius. And um, the Obama administration, the women actually created a, something they called amplification, where if, if um, Susan says something, Beth then echoes Susan's point, right? And so they were trying to get around that. There's interruptions, there's not being heard, there's being, uh, being interrupted. And I'm just wondering how you navigate that and what advice you might have for others. Well, I come from a family of six girls, six daughters, and we have an incredibly empowering father. My mother passed away. She was very obviously encouraging as well. So we grew up with a very strong sense of who we are, even though in the beginning it was incredibly difficult. And you talk about bullying, I mean, heck, I was bullied before I even knew what that term meant. I mean, it was <laughs> tough on the playground, man. If you don't speak English, uh, you're dressed differently, and you look differently, I mean, it was tough. But my parents created such a wonderful home for us where we found stability, security, and it was our solace. And we were very close as a family unit. The only opinions that mattered to us was that of our family members. So if our peer pressure was uh, very strong and, and adversely so, we didn't really care. I think that's kind of telling, and it's instructive. I think you have to give your children a strong sense that they belong someplace whether it's the home, the family, whatever it is, but they belong and they have value. Whatever it is, they have value. So even though we were incredibly, you know, I mean, we were poor, but we never felt we were poor. I mean, I remember going on like field trips with my American classmates when I was in third grade and I had four cents. Now, admittedly, I was, I'm very old now, so four cents, those days didn't seem as meager as it is now, but it was still meager. And, my, and I, it was four cents for a carton of milk, and that was it. 
I would go on these field trips and my classmates would buy all sorts of souvenirs and they would buy everything, candies and everything. And I only have four cents of a carton of milk. And, but I never felt that we were poor because we were so imbued with a sense of our own possibilities. America is a great country where we're gonna have such exciting lives here. I mean, life was good. So I think that you have to kind of empower your children with a sense of value. Now having, so we always felt that we just had great futures ahead of us. And then we also had games. So we were called, there's a wonderful Chinese fable um, and it's called Hua Mulan. You know the Disney film Mulan? It's about this little girl who goes off to war, becomes a general. Uh, the real story, it's a folklore in China. It's called Mulan. It's a famous story. It's a story about a young woman who had an aging father and a very young brother. The emperor came along and wanted to conscript the men in the household. And every household had to give up one man. Her father was too old. So out of filial piety, love for the father, she wanted to protect him. Her brother was too young, so she wanted to protect her brother. So she disguised herself as a man and became and joined the army and rose to become one of the most famous generals in China's, China's history. And she was in masquerade for 10 years. So my sisters and I, we saw ourselves as women warriors. We were going to be their guardians of women's rights, and we were going to protect the rights of women. And so we armed together. We were women warriors. We were going to fight for what's right. So it became something that was so empowering, that was so much fun, and it gave us a great deal of confidence. So how does now, that translate into your current role, right? Okay, so having said that, but I think you're right. So of all of us who are women, we've been in positions where we have been, um, our voices have not been heard or as valued as highly as others. So I think this point that you just made about women reinforcing the voices, the viewpoints of other women is a wonderful one. But I also think deep down inside, Every single one of us, whether you're a woman or a man, you have to have a sense that you're of some worth and some value. And it's totally unconnected to material wealth. So there was a And so, you know, you just, and if some people treat you badly, if you can do something about it, you should. If you can't, you remember. <laughs> <laughs> you remember so that in the future you're kinder to others but also you know, so that you can be more instructive of others as well. So there was a, sur a, a study um, that we talked about earlier of the Supreme Court that found that female justices are interrupted three times more frequently than male justices, even at the Supreme Court level. And so you're in a situation where um, you proportionately have many fewer women, so you really can't even do the amplification strategy in this cabinet. Uh, so what, what do, do you feel that you are heard? Do you, are there things that you need to do to be heard? In when I was younger, I did not feel that I was being heard. But I'm not into victimization either. Uh, you know, I don't think I, I've been taken advantage of. People were mean to me. But I never felt I was a victim. And if I could help it, I was not going to subject myself to the indignities that others would heap on me. And I didn't do it in a nasty way, but I think I gave out an aura that I'm not gonna take gum, you know, I'm not gonna take gum from you. I'm gonna be my own person and I know who I am. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think it's me, you know, I think we were, we were raised that way. So I think a good sense of who you are, but to do it in a way that's not, that's off putting either. You know, technology is wonderful, and I, I, I'm a tremendous, I'm so in awe of technology, but even in this world in which we're entering, people still make the difference. And so I tell a lot of young people, you know, you have to deal with people. And when, especially in all the different jobs that I've had, they've been wonderful jobs, they've been really tough jobs. The policy part is easy. Do you know what's the hardest? It's the people. 
trying to get other people to kind of be, come together, be persuaded of a particular point of view, crafting a common consensus, moving the whole group forward. That takes a lot of work. So, great segue into your current role, Department of Transportation. So during the campaign, President Trump promised to spend more than a trillion, I believe over 10 years, on infrastructure. There isn't yet a roadmap for securing those funds, or yet a roadmap for to- No, to we do, I think, and, and we do. Okay. And we can talk so about it. We can talk a little bit about that, and what I, I think what would be very interesting for all of us to understand is, once you have those funds, or those funds are in sight, what are your absolute first priorities? What is the first thing you want to get done? Okay, the question is kind of wrong-ended, mm -hmm. because the federal government should not be in charge of determining what the priorities are. The state and local governments should be. So we have one of the most decentralized transportation systems in the world. 84% of federal of monies spent on transportation infrastructure comes from the states. Only 16 come from the federal sector. So of the $1 trillion to be invested over 10 years, there will be direct federal funding of $200 billion minimum. And the reason you don't want to fund 100% with federal dollars is number one, it will create havoc with our, with our deficit, and because uh, we don't have the money. Two, uh, for every dollar that the federal government puts, it actually displaces one state, one state dollar. So it's a one-to-one -one dollar displacement. So we want to partner with the state and local governments and to make sure that they are in with us to address the issues. So they will decide what the priorities are. They're gonna get the money. It will probably be a combination of uh, formula grants and, uh, gr and uh, formula grants and application kind of uh, competitive grants. So if a, com if, a, um, if a state and local government can bring in more innovative financing involving the private sector, uh, they'll probably get a larger federal share. So let me just go over that again. A trillion dollars, $200 billion in direct government funding, a minimum. There'll be some asset sales of some sort. And then the remainder will be made up with partnerships with the private sector. So as of now, you might be interested to know that currently the private sector cannot invest in public infrastructure in some states. So they're actually discriminated against. We want to be able to allow the private sector to invest in the federal sector. And the monies, the 200 billion that would be used, that would be spent by the government, federal government, will be like seed money. It's to seed money to entice the private sector to come in. And uh, you know, one, and this public-private partnership, uh, it's, it's been there, it's a concept that's been there a long time, but many uh, people are unfamiliar with it, so I'll give you an example. In the maritime field, for example, um, the military, they have many, many shipping requirements, especially during a time of conflict. Uh, we now have um, a lot of shipments that are required to go to the Middle East to go to South Korea, to go to Guam, to go all over, everywhere. Now, the military can ship this themselves by ordering more gray hull military Navy ships. But at a pop of about $300 million each, it's very, very expensive. And so what the military does is to partner, they contract US private sector merchant marine ships. And the merchant marine ships are given a contract and they ship like uh, the household goods of military personnel overseas. Uh, they ship the cars. And they don't ship the tanks, for example, but you know, others. And uh, they, they give the benefit of their familiarity with ports, how to ship things uh, to the government. So the government utilizes the private sector, merchant marine expertise in shipping goods and utilization of farm ports. And that's an example of how the public 
sector and the private sector can work together and it's to the benefit of the American public and it's at a substantial, uh, it's at a more efficient rate and at a less expensive rate as well. Because you can imagine, you know, if the military were to build ships to carry all the military shipments they need, it's not just the ships. The military would have to know how to commercially ship and how to interact with all the ports throughout the world. And they may not have that kind of expertise, you know, and so they rely upon the private sector. That's one example of the public-private partnerships that can occur. And on the surface area, a toll road certainly is one a big, uh, one uh, frequently cited example, but there can be many, many others as well. And the infrastructure will include not only transportation improvements, but also water, energy, and probably the Veterans Affairs Hospitals uh, system as well. So I'm gonna, let me just follow up on the innovation and then we're gonna open up the floor for questions. Okay. Um, on the innovation piece, which I think is really intriguing, there, there's been actually a lot of conversation here at the conference about self-driving cars and infrastructure in particular. And I think the, the debate is um, putting money into improving our roads and tunnels and bridges. Um, is that the right way to go? Or at, at a time when everything we're hearing this week is about um, technology and smart cars and how we, you know, Uber and Waymo and Ford and GM and others are looking at these smart cars so that the idea being that perhaps improving and building new roads would become obsolete in a few years. And there's a, there's a near term, short term, short term, near term, medium term, long term. And obviously, we've just been talking about the short term. Uh, autonomous vehicles would definitely change the uh, structure of our infrastructure, but not so much in the short term that we won't need as many roads. But it does lead to an interesting uh, initiative that the administration is undertaking in the skies. So uh, on June 13th, the administration announced the um, new initiative of liberalize, liberating the air traffic control from the FAA. Basically, what is happening now is that we're getting delays and congestions in the air because the air traffic control system is based on 1960s radar technology. In an age of GPSs, the air traffic control system still relies upon radar. Because it's outdated or uh, not as modern technology, the spacing between the airplanes have to be further apart than they can be under a GPA system. So let me give you an example. A radar sweeps every six seconds. A plane travels a mile every 12 seconds. So for every six seconds, you cannot see where the plane is. You assume that the plane is on the same linear path well, what if it's not? So that is why the air traffic controllers have to space out the airplanes uh, further apart from each other because of the technology. Another example, when a plane lands or takes off, they come down, let's say coming down, um, landing. They have to land in a staircase pattern because that is the technology that is required currently to have landings occur. If it were GPS, the plane would be able to come down in a fair, smooth swoop. Because currently the plane is coming down in a staircase pattern, we have to, again, separate the airplanes further apart to allow for that configuration coming down. So the air traffic controllers are the hardest working people. And I want to emphasize that our airspace is the safest in the world. The point that I'm trying to make is we are now seeing the entry of autonomous vehicles in the sky. They're called drones. They're involved in um, checking on accidents. Uh, they're involved in satellite, uh, all sorts of different configurations and functions they're now increasingly prevalent in the skies. How do we deal with big airplanes, small airplanes, drones? We're gonna have a billion passengers 
by 2020, we're going to see an incredible influx of new entrants that have to be integrated into the national airspace. Our air traffic controllers, these hardworking men and women, need to have the most up-to-date tools and technologies to enable them to address this increasingly complicated um, airspace. So the administration is proposing that the air traffic control be separated out from FAA, be put into a non-governmental, independent, non-profit co-op. And what that means is they will be able to come out from the very bureaucratic uh, procurement processes of the federal government. So for an example, you'll be just horrified. Uh, it takes about five to seven years, three to seven years to get new equipment. Now, how often does the equipment on your desktop change? So by the time that the equipment comes on stream, it's already not the most up-to-date. And again, the hardworking men and women of the, of, the air, of the air traffic control, they need to have the best equipment possible. The second issue I would make is there's something called the Aviation Trust Fund, which is all user funded. There's $6 billion in surpluses in there that's not being used for reinvestment in the air traffic control system. So if the air traffic control were non-governmental, away from the vagaries of the congressional appropriations process, that surplus can now be 100% reinvested into the system to maintain it and to improve it. You can see I'm really excited about this. <laughs> so, but it's going to help the delays and the congestion. That is the most important thing. So um, that is what we're trying to do. And so we have, this is where an example where you have autonomous vehicles, they're changing and we need to accommodate their new entry into uh, every aspect of our transportation infrastructure. So we have time for some questions. We see hands popping up in the air. And we have microphones in the audience. And we see Walter and Jane first. See that? He, di he didn't bully me at all. <laughs> so um, Elaine, we've been friends for decades. And there are lots of bipartisan friendships. And I say that as a preamble to yes. um, say how sad I am about the way Congress works. This isn't your fault. But for example, on health care, which you addressed. I was part of the group that when I was then in Congress who voted for Obamacare. It was a totally partisan vote and that legislation would have been better uh, for sure if it had been a bipartisan vote and some of the ideas that were in it at the beginning had been retained. Uh, similarly, now we have a total partisan vote. I, this it is would not, be better if it were not. If it and it would bipartisan. be better if it were bipartisan Absolutely. and maybe that will happen. But my question is really not about health care, but about why infrastructure isn't a higher priority on the national agenda, because there's a place where there is genuinely bipartisan buy-in. It, it's more, it seems to me, it ha there's more bipartisanship there than there is, for example, on tax reform, which at least as I understand it is coming next after, if, it, if the health care issue ever gets resolved. So, this is your jurisdiction infrastructure, and my question is, are there things you can do to increase the priority for this administration in putting infrastructure issues before the Congress and in finally generating real bipartisan support for a, what is a national priority? Well, I, I totally agree with you. If there's one area that can be bipartisan, it would be infrastructure, because we all care about it. We're all victims of the congestion and delays that occur. Um, the calendar, as you well know, is not determined only by me, but they needed to get the Affordable Health Care Act, and then they, get a, they needed the, to get uh, the tax reform done, and then it was infrastructure, because some of the uh, tax reform uh, reforms uh, was possibly talked about as potential, um, as potential uh, funding of the infrastructure as well. So that was how it was done. So it is what it is. To follow up on Jane's yeah. question, if you could have your way on infrastructure, how would you make it bipartisan? How would you call together 
the proper senators, the proper, you know, if, if, if the oh. president just said, why don't you get this done, who would you call in and how would you make it a bipartisan process? I think we're in a bipartisan mode right now. We're in discussions with uh, members of the Congress and there's just differences about the most difficult thing, which is the pay fors. So everybody agrees that we need to fix the infrastructure, but there's disagreement about how to pay for it and who to pay for it. And there's some people who don't want to pay for it at all. So you can imagine. Uh, so that is what is holding up right now. And we need to be in discussion with the Congress on both sides of the aisle uh, because there needs to be a sustainable and a consensus-oriented approach as to how to pay for it. Just to follow we're up right on, in, the of, in the thick of it. To follow up on what Walter asked you, though, how long, what would you, be your ETA? How long do you think it will take to get that consensus so that you can start moving ahead? Well, we, we, set, out, we set out the principles in May and send them to the Congress, and uh, this is uh, the discussion that occurs on you know, what we're uh, willing to do and then it goes to the other side. Now, what are you guys willing to do in the Congress? Not necessarily Democrat or Republicans, because the White House and the Congress may not always agree either. Uh, so the principles were set up, sent up in May, and we've been in discussion about the principles. And hopefully, uh, more principles or legislative language would be slated in uh, the fall. But if the two uh, legislative priorities before infrastructure get delayed, the Affordable Health Care Act and tax reform, then probably infrastructure will be delayed as well. Next question. We have a gentleman over here. I just want to say another. I don't have my glasses on, so I'm kind of. Swindling. Is that oh, Mayor there. Henry Cisneros over there? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Mayor. <laughs> we have a gentleman oh, back here. Uh, yeah. Uh, I've been working on communities all over the United States on how you create a sense of place in them. And transportation funds can either be used for infrastructure, but that doesn't mean they're building the community. Uh, you can create, you can use funds for making streets safer. You can use funds for creating accessibility versus mobility. So you're bringing people to the places people want to go. So you can have an enormous impact with transportation funds on community development, on economic development for local businesses. But if you go the old route where it's uh, my way or the highway or you're just adding to the road system and expanding the capacity of vehicles rather than improving the, the, the communities, it's a very different track. And you could be a real hero to the main streets all over rural America, all over all the cities, if you came out with a program that was really about, we're gonna help you to create the places that you need in your communities to thrive, and roads can do a lot for that. You know, I just came from the G7 transport ministers meeting in Sardinia, uh, and um, it's amazing how similar all our problems are in transportation. So. All industrial, most industrialized countries are facing the same issues. Uh, we're all facing aging infrastructure, crumbling infrastructure, and we're all looking for ways to connect our country physically as well as um, virtually. Uh, but that sense of community is exacerbated or uh, detracted by the physical infrastructure that we have. So. Uh, you know, I certainly agree with you on that. Actually, my idea for the branding of this was connecting America, but I lost. Uh, <laughs> uh, next, we have a question over here. Hello. When I'm uh, not living in Snowmass, we have a high, we have a condominium and a high rise in Los Angeles. And last month, I was standing at the window, ceiling to floor window, looking out. And all of a sudden, I saw a drone, this is 31 floors up, fly right in front of my window. I saw the camera spin around, pointing directly at me. I tried to take a picture of it and went for my phone. And it, of course, took off and have no idea from where it came. And our association has no idea how to deal with these kinds of things. You touched on it earlier. Can you elaborate on what? the solutions being looked at are in this regard for privacy concerns? What is your association? Well, the, the homeowners association oh, oh, in the building. Okay, I see it, yeah. 
So no, it's a huge. Uh, yeah, it's a privacy. We issue, love technology. Obviously. We love technology. You know, all of us um, embrace technology in so many different ways. There are robots out there, right in this building, in the hallway. I'm gonna. You know, it's fantastic. It's a whole new brave world that we see out there. There are also obviously some other considerations. So as we grow into this exciting new world, other issues arise, such as safety. Uh, when drones fly into the airspace of real big airplanes, or even little airplanes, it's not a good thing. Security. These drones are autonomous vehicles, are computers. I mean, you can turn them into weapons of destruction. And then privacy. What happens when they're like 31 floors up and they're taking pictures? Who's doing that? Who are they? So currently the rules are um, that you're not supposed to fly over, these drones are not supposed to fly over people, heads of people, and they must be within the line of sight. So the operator of the drones cannot lose sight of their drone. Uh, the FAA requires registration of all drones larger than half a pound, but you might be interested to note that a hobbyist challenged that, and he won. So now the court has uh, put a stay on the government's ability to register every single drone of a certain size, and this uh, just came out two weeks ago, and we are trying to deal with we're trying to consider and evaluate what is the best path uh, forward. In the absence of the federal government acting, um, states are acting on their own. And so the federal government is trying to work with the states and the states with us on how to deal with a plethora of possible state regulations. Uh, and so it's a brand new world, and we're all feeling our way. And hopefully, we're not too slow uh, in the response. Gentlemen over here. In the blue? <laughs> Getting two mics. <laughs> Thank you, Secretary. Um, do you see a way that, um, that the infrastructure uh, fix can be energized through use, use of the individual states? You refer um, to the importance of states in a number of respects. I'm just wondering, in light of the, uh, the um, what's going on in, in, or not going on in Congress right now, whether or not there's any way for uh, uh, the states to act as a catalyst um, to try, whether independently or together, um, to try to begin the process and maybe stimulate uh, Washington. Actually, the states are our leaders. And it's great that they are leaders because they're smaller and they can be kind of like pilots. If something works, then it can be uh, best practiced or copied in other states. So Indiana uh, was successful in first coming out with toll roads. Now, this, subsequently, um, there have been other states that have had toll roads. And if it's a public-private partnership, for example, if the toll road contractor or investor goes bankrupt, it goes bankrupt. But the state doesn't suffer because they can't take the road with them. So we're learning a lot, uh, but um, we encourage the states, actually, if it's within their borders, to kind of experiment. So Missouri has been a really uh, wonderful state in terms of trying some new ideas, and um, Indiana, Ohio. So we work with the states on that. In fact, it's preferable that we work on one-on-one -on -one basis with the state let them experiment a little bit, see whether it works, and then use the best practices for the rest of the country, rather than have a one-size-fits-all uh, imposition on everybody throughout the whole 50 states, and then find that some things don't work in Alaska, or some things don't work in Hawaii, or some things don't work in Ohio. So we have time for one more question. Um, the woman over here. Thank you. Um, we'll first of all, <laughs> I'll be quick. Um, I want to say thank you, particularly for sharing some of your personal stories as someone who also emigrated from uh, Lebanon and looked different and had a weird name and couldn't speak the language. Uh, that really resonated with me, so thank you. 
Uh, I work for a company called BlackRock, and yeah. it's, uh, for those of you who don't know, a large asset manager, and we have a pretty sizable alternatives business as part of that asset management company. So I'm really, really curious to hear more of your um, strategy, I guess, as it relates to the funding of the infrastructure projects. How far along are you guys with your outreach for the different companies that would potentially help with that um, you know, privatization effort, which uh, definitely makes sense on paper, but a little bit on your strategy in terms of how to engage with the private sector. Well, this is a huge issue, because when, pro when we say privatization, we don't say privatization. Privatization automatically spurs an anti-policy, uh, anti-feeling right away. There's just some members of Congress who just don't believe in privatization. They don't trust the private sector, and they think privatization is very, very bad. So words, uh, you know, branding words make a difference. BlackRock is very well, Blackstone, BlackRock yeah, is very well known. And so what we encourage people to do is to work at the local level, because the local, the states, and the local level are the ones who will be coming uh, to the federal government uh, for these competitive grants. So for high-speed rail, for example, there are high-speed rail projects. I know you, I'm not saying you're involved in that. But there are high-speed rail projects from Dallas to Houston. There's a bright line in Florida. There's a high-speed rail being considered in Nevada, from Nevada to uh, Los Angeles. If I have one uh, word of advice, is that for high-speed rail to work, there has to be population density along the corridor, number one, and number two. It has to be city center to city center. Because if you build the high-speed rail and it lands, like the terminus is right outside the city or in a very hard to get part of the, of the city, people aren't gonna go. They're not gonna Uber from their home to the station and then go into the city again. So in, in the most successful models are city center to city center. Having said that, I'm gonna throw out another um, issue that we're, that we're considering and so that you can kind of understand or get a glimpse as to the kinds of issues that we're facing. And that is we don't have any high-speed rail expertise in the United States. We don't even have production of manufactured steel of a certain type. And manufacturing is now so sophisticated, everything is almost um, it's like fabrication. So how would it look and how does it how would it play with Americans if we tell them that we've just sold a piece of high-speed rail to the Japanese or to the French or to Germans? I mean, so a lot of people wouldn't like that. And yet we can't, within a very short time, jumpstart our own manufacturing. So those are the, you know, so how do we prepare, how do we lay the pathwork for considering maybe we need to have some of these foreign expertise. Um, and then there are other you know, questions uh, like how do, we, how do we let the private sector know that they're welcome but not show any favoritism? Because we can't do that. So we cannot go out to a block rock and say, you're expert in this area. And there are only a handful of them. You know, you'd be terrific at this. We can't do that. So it has to be mass communications and uh, so we basically tell people, you know, try to amplify as much as we can what our plans are, what it's likely to occur, what the administration's plans are. But don't forget, this is a democracy. So the Congress plays in this. So what we propose may come out completely different when it goes through the Congress. And that's what democracy is all about. So but, we are out of time. Okay, did there you was wanna, a gentleman over there who was trying to. More. Okay, we're gonna take an extra bonus question. Thank you, and thank you for being here today. Uh, real quickly, your thoughts on increasing the federal gas tax as a funding source hasn't been addressed in years, and it's really a user fee. And then secondly, um, to build on the rail thing, uh, your thoughts about transit, inner city transit. Uh, where uh, in Minnesota, we're talking about lots of issues with transit, and uh, just curious about your thoughts. On the gasoline tax, the highway trust fund which is a fund that uh, is used to 
accumulate the user fees, the gasoline taxes, and then disperse it for improvements in the roads, it's going to be in a deficit situation by 2020 because of the increased uh, fuel efficiency you know, that, uh, of cars these days. So it is going to be insufficient. Uh, so there are, there are about 17 or different, 18 different ways to help pay for the infrastructure, and all of them are tough, which is why I go back to my original point. There are different ways to pay for it, but nobody likes um, all of them. Nobody, so it's hard to get consensus on which ones. On the transit, transit is primarily a urban phenomenon, even light rail, because it needs the population density. And what the greatest, one of the biggest gaps that we've seen today is the gap between rural America and urban America. There was a wonderful session just preceding this one about rural versus urban America. And so somehow we have to include you know, rural America, make them feel the sense of community, that they're, they're, in, they're connected to the rest of America. So the top six cities receive 40% of the funding for transit dollars. New York and California get the massive, as you can imagine, um, you know, uh, amounts of transit dollars. So there's a lot of resentment in countries uh, in, this, in the areas in between uh, that don't get that money. So these are tough issues. And again, when we talk about gaps, you know, it's not partisan, not just partisan. It's rural versus America. They're all different kinds. But I want to end on a on a really upbeat note. And that is that we, you know, I was in a foreign country and, I, and they were amazed that I was the Secretary of Transportation of the United States. They couldn't kind of quite get that. They thought I was like the Secretary of Transportation from China. No, I said, no, <laughs> from the United States. And they said, you know what, well, in our country, someone who looks so different, you know, no, they said it this way, they said, in our country, someone who's blonde haired and blue eyed would never be appointed to the upper echelons of our government. You know, so I've been in this country 40 some odd years now, and the diversity of our country is so vibrant. And we are so tolerant as a nation. Sure, we've got problems, but overall, we're the freest country in the world. And I really uh, encourage young people that you've got to have a dream. You know, this country is a place where anything can happen. If you believe in yourself and you have a dream, anything can happen. I'm here. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to the audience and thank you, Secretary Chow.